Famous archaeologist, doctor of historical sciences, Zainola Samashev led archaeological expeditions that unveiled such burial mounds as Berel, Yelekesazi, and others. The scientist wrote more than 400 scientific works on the history and culture of Central Asian people, publishing approximately 40 monographs. Zainola Samashev's colleagues call him an expert on petroglyphs of the Kazakh land. Recently, we have been hearing more reports about the discovery of golden men. Are they all real and what should the original be? The definition of golden man was initiated by journalists. This happened in the late 60s, early 70s, as soon as this relic was found in the Isik burial mound. The same findings were discovered in the Shilikti burial ground of the East Kazakhstan region, in Aral Tobe of the Atirao region, in the Taldi mound in central Kazakhstan. However, they were inside looted burial sites. Findings were severely destroyed and most of the fragments were already stolen. It is clear that all these findings relate to the Saka period. They say that there are five, six or even seven so-called golden men. However, people have different opinions. For example, some experts believe that they all can be called golden men, and I as an expert can say that only artifacts from the Isik Barrow, which has been preserved in its original form, should be considered authentic. They have not been looted and destroyed. Therefore, I think that it is not necessary to exaggerate their total number and consider them to be the golden man. We shall call the others somehow differently. Probably it is no matter how to call them, golden man or somehow differently. All of them are great values that our ancestors left from the Saka period. I think so. How many remains buried in golden robes were found in looted and intact mounds? I cannot say. I have never counted them. I tried, but every time I lost count. In general, everything that was found in such a robe is called the Golden Man. But this is nothing more than an attempt by individual scientists to realize their ambitions. How many Golden Men did you personally find? We always find fragments of golden robes in all the burial grounds where I excavate. But I do not call them Golden Men. Personally, I found only one golden man in the Yele Kesazi barrow. In Berel, there also were mounds with remains of people dressed in gold, but they were heavily looted and destroyed. For example, Vasily Radlov excavated a mound in which 17 horses were buried. We found ones with 13, 10 and 7 horses. These were all burials of the Saka aristocracy. But whether each of them can be called a golden man is a big question. In general, the golden robe points on military routes. Saka wore kaftans, such short fur coats, and when a soldier was buried, he was dressed in clothes decorated with details from certain materials, depending on his origin. This was considered their robe in the afterlife. Besides golden items, the mounds contained things that they did not use in ordinary life. They were specially made for the afterlife. Many such things were found in the graves of the Saka aristocracy. Particularly, ritual robes, rich in jewelry, were made for burial. There were also dishes, military equipment, mortified horses with all the ammunition and accessories necessary for riding. Many 
Believing that after death a person will continue to exist in the other world, they even left food in the graves. The garments in which representatives of the nobility were buried featured many symbolic signs. Golden items on clothes were not applied haphazardly, but in a strictly defined order. Rulers, soldiers and those who served in power had their clothing. Golden decorations for clothes were made depending on the position held and the authority of the person in society. We talked a lot about gold, but did not mention other things found during excavations. What finds can be more valuable than gold? Speaking from the point of view of archaeology as a science, we find a lot of things that are much more valuable than gold. I would especially note, for example, Berel Barrows, where a horse harness made entirely of wood was discovered. This is a real work of art. Its details were gilded, and under the gilding, the entire surface was covered with amazing drawings, which were made by a skilled craftsman. Saka occupies a special place in the process of researching ancient works of art. Their golden products, if we consider them not as a valuable metal, but from an artistic point of view, are of particular interest to science. Or, for example, a silver bowl from the Isig Barrow. The painting on it is more valuable for research than kilograms and even tons of gold. The information that this bowl contains is much more valuable than any other jewelry. What is it talking about? It shows the level of development of society from the point of view of science, culture and many other aspects. This relic is more important than gold. And there are many such artifacts. For example, the Sarai Shik jug of burnt clay. It was an excerpt from the poem Graceful Knowledge by Yusuf Balasaguni. An amazing thing. Such findings cannot be compared with gold. They keep special value for our history. Part of the valuable relics is stored in the regions, part in Almaty and in the National Museum in the capital. But do regional museums have enough equipment and security for the preservation of these artifacts? Maybe. Now there is some shortage of equipment, but in the future this issue must be solved. Museums should get good equipment to preserve the exhibits. Each area of the Kazakh land is sacred in its own way, and therefore there must be museums everywhere. But the state of affairs in regional museums and their compliance with international standards is an important matter. I am sure that they simply need to be developed and raised to the world level. There are two categories of mounds, looted and not looted. How many surviving burial grounds are currently known? If we talk about the Saka period, then only a few. This is the Isik Mound and the Yeleke Sazi burial in the Tabagatai region of East Kazakhstan region. In general, one can talk about the ruin of monuments for a very long time. There are many nuances. The mind of people who lived 2,500, 3,000 years ago and the mind of modern men are completely different. 
For example, in ancient times, skillful coffins were made of wood and stone, and then they were burned along with the deceased. Modern person does not understand this. In ancient times, this was a burial ritual. A man was buried with all his wealth, property and horses. These graves were robbed. Or another example, at all times there were warring nations and tribes and to start a war, some robbed the burial places of the ancestors of others. This is evidenced by Herodotus. He writes that they sent each other messages demanding to start a war and receive the answer. If you want war, ruin the burial places of our ancestors and we will accept the challenge. This was in ancient times, but theft exists at the present time, doesn't it? The ruin of the mounds, the theft of valuable artifacts from museums, the falsification of exhibits, all this began in the 90s of the last century and continues to this day. This is not a rare case both for Russia, China and Kazakhstan. If you go to the steppe and find the ravaged Saka mounds, you can see how they were excavated from the top into the very depth. And the most valuable relics were stolen from there. So the whole international mafia acts. Then they put it all on the internet, sell or exchange stolen property. Do they find really valuable relics? I think yes. The photos of truly valuable artifacts with comments on where they were found and offers for their sale fall into our hands through various channels. Museums have no money for their purchase and then they fall into the hands of businessmen and wealthy people who can afford to buy them. We know that this is illegal, but none of those involved in this has been caught red-handed. No one has been punished for ruining our history over the past 20, 30 or 40 years. Do you have any evidence that this or that rare exhibit illegally fell into someone's hands? Of course. Sometimes, through the Internet or other channels, we get photos of special artifacts that are sold for millions. That's how precious relics fall into private hands. Basically, they can be sold to tourists coming from abroad. Local museums do not have such money, and connoisseurs of antiquity are unlikely to buy it. Therefore, they are required by foreigners, well, or very rich locals. But fortunately, there is an understanding that the problem must be solved and the state understands this and is trying to somehow prevent such acts, initiating laws. Last year, for example, certain amendments to the law were introduced. The law has become stricter in this regard. But as you can see, this does not stop criminals.
Bıraktığı soğan karamay olsun da kuluslar hele toktaiknemiz. Onun üstüne kadar arkeolojik çalışmalar mı? Everyone can get a license to conduct private archaeological excavations today. I think this question really worries you. Of course I'm worried about it. We raise the question of issuing licenses at all levels. The way licenses are issued now only contributes to what we just talked about. One needs to provide certain documents to obtain official permission to conduct excavations and if everything is okay with them, then you will receive it. Earlier, a license was issued only to specialists, professional archaeologists, as private individuals. After the adoption of the law on public procurement, organizations received the right to participate in tenders. We say that it is necessary to stop such a license. Previously, there was such a thing as a letter of permission. We called it open sheet. It is necessary to switch to this system again and then tighten control over the activities of the one who received this license. Do all of those who receive a license contribute to historical science? That is the problem. Before issuing a license, you need to make sure why a person is going to excavate at all. You can't do this only because money is allocated for it. This process should unveil new information of ancient history and fill its gaps. For example, one can learn about ancient metallurgy, how it was arranged, what was the structure of ancient furnaces, metal alloying processes and the manufacture of products from them. This is a scientific problem. And to solve this problem, it is necessary to excavate only for research purposes. So are you against conducting aimless excavations? I am against, of course. Such excavations can lead only to an increase in crime. If the excavations are carried out aimlessly, then people will dig everywhere and everything, and there will be no sense in it. After the excavations, records of what was found should be kept and everything should be entered into a single database, on the basis of which our scientists would form new episodes of our history. For this, archaeological excavations excavations are needed. Otherwise, they simply do not make sense. For example, we have many mysteries about the Bronze Age. There are questions about the ancient Turkic period. And if we had a coordinating council that would help solve all these issues, it would be good. To do this, the Ministry of Education and Science should provide grants. Accordingly, we need a council that would mediate between research centers and the ministry. What is the historical continuity between the people of that period and the current Kazakhs? What do discovered artifacts and genetic science say about this? Over the past 10 years, paleogenetic science is developing rapidly. A comparative study of the products and materials used, their composition and structure, and especially the livestock breeding system from the Bronze Age to the era of the formation of the Kazakh ethnic group, demonstrates a clear continuity and connection between generations. 
Recently, more paleogenetic studies appeared, but they're only developing in Kazakhstan. And I think the future of this science is promising. But the methodology of this science is not yet fully formed. There are still shortcomings, but I think the situation will soon change. Of course, you should not think that research will answer all questions at once. For example, when we conducted excavations in the Yele Kesazi, we handed over the remains of five, six people who were dressed in golden clothes to geneticists. <laughs> And they found a kinship between some of them. But then the question arose, what kind of relationship was between them? The same thing happened with the remains at the Burel burial mound. Who exactly was the woman buried next to the ruler? Previously, we probably would have immediately thought that she was his wife. But thanks to the paleogenetic research, we found that that woman was his mother. And in the Yelekesazi, next to the man, we found the remains of a young girl. Studies showed us that they had a family relationship. Most likely, they were brother and sister. The research is ongoing now, but more systematic work is yet to come. We more admire the relics of other nations. Have we finally realized the value of the relics of our own? No, not yet realized. We are only on the way to this awareness. There are things that are evaluated differently in different periods of time. Let it be a weapon, clothes or something else found during excavations. At some time, we paid attention only to the external form of things, but did not give due attention to the structural methods of their manufacture. For example, a bowl found in the Isig burial mound. Although we appreciate its significance, we still cannot understand its content. But in the future, it will be investigated. Here it is necessary to consider each region separately. Research objects found in different regions carry different information, different technology, different quality. We still cannot realize their roles in the lives of people who lived in a particular area. I'm not just talking about work products. I would also like to say about the huge complex of monuments located in the lower reaches of the Sirdarya River in the area called Cherik Rabat. Archaeologist Zoldasbek Kumankulov is excavating there. These monuments appeared in ancient times. No one paid attention to them. But I can say that we still have not understood and appreciated what we have there. <laughs> Did your dream come true as an archaeologist? No. What are you dreaming about? I dream to put together everything that I have discovered in my life and on this basis write the ancient history of our people, land and country. Thank you for the interview. Good luck.
Rahmet Thank you. Kızlarımızda da. Thank you.